All right, welcome back. Part two with uh, Chris Kellett here. We were talking about um, ways to fix state sectionals, whatever. I thought, uh, tell me if this is possible. Could you do sectionals mid-season or at the end of the season? Because like right now, we know sectionals like a month before the season starts or right, you know, when the season starts. Could you just wait and hold off? Is that a possibility? Um, you know, that's kind of why, you know, with my idea, just having two major groupings and not four, that kind of alleviates a lot of those stresses. Yeah. Um, you know, because like I said, every year is going to be so different. Um, and especially with, you know, some players leaving the state, going to prep schools, um, injuries, just the, the overall talent shift and change. So every year is different. You know, to me, I'd like two huge pods and then you get seated and, and then you play who you play and you just kind of go from there. And I do miss the, the, they weren't even super sectionals, but I like, you know, like when I played in the early two thousands playing at UW Oshkosh and, and Green Bay, like that was, you know, for us to sit there as players and watch Sheboygan North play Cedarburg. And then we played Fondy right after with a packed house. It was, it was pretty special. Those are kind of the things I remember. Yeah. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm a 95, I didn't play basketball, but we went to state in 95 from Appleton East. And I remember, uh, you know, playing, I remember at Oshkosh and, at those big arenas, which was awesome to go to and watch. So, um, so what's, so I, I don't know if you've answered the question or not. Could you do it if there's no, you know, we're not doing two, we're not, we're going to keep it at four sectionals. Could you just redo the sectionals at the end of the year or in the middle? Like what's the, what's the downside or what's the advantage of getting out those sectionals right away? Yeah, I honestly, Maybe I don't know I don't, the answer. I'm curious. I'm just curious. Yeah, that I don't, you know, don't really know. You know, to me, it's, you know, you're, you're going to, for us, for example, there's so many Fox Valley teams and FRCC and, you know, there's and, and Valley. So we're going to see the same teams, you know, for the most part, no matter what. So it's not a huge deal. Um, you know, the teams that it's tough for are the superiors, the Hudson's kind of over there, which I understand. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, they, they can't enjoy driving all the way over here either for every sport too. So yeah, I'm not sure if there is a perfect scenario just based off of the, you know, the division one and all the schools, you know, and, and, and where they're located with the populations and stuff. But if you cut it into two halves and just did it in two major big pods, and I don't think there'd be much more travel and you'd play some new guys and some new people. I know from an FVA standpoint, I would like to not play FVA teams if possible. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a kind of a, a letdown because we know each other so well, you know, talking to, um, to Hortonville, you know, we played them twice, one game, double overtime, the second one, they got us, then we play them in the playoffs, you know, so we know each other, we know every player on the team. Um, and it's, it's just kind of a grinded out, you know, game. So it's, it just makes it more challenging. Yeah. I mean, you guys played three times, Appleton, West and Nina played three times, Appleton, West and Oshkosh North played three times. I mean, these are all the teams that played each other in, you know, in the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's way, there's rooms to room to tweak it and, and things, but okay. Um, you had mentioned the shot clock. I had on the list. What are your thoughts on the shot clock? Well, this might surprise you a little bit based off of our last game. Um, but <laughs> we had a, an AAU, you know, the first time I was ever using a shot clock besides Lawrence, you know, that's college kids. It's, it's different. They're a lot higher IQ. They all love the game. They all want to play it, but AAU, we use a shot clock on the Adidas circuit. And we had teams, you know, my first team with, with playground warriors, we started six or uh, three guys under six foot. We had Adam Pullman from Nina and Nate Nevu from Oshkosh North. And then Cam Ward, who was listed at six, one was probably maybe six foot, hundred pounds, went to Vermont, had a really good career. Um, but we beat a lot of teams we shouldn't have because our, we had really smart players and we, we were crafty and we got into, it enhances a lot of ball screen action. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it because, you know, we had quarters and teams didn't hold it for the last minute. Um, and it's just, if you have good guard play, it, it's great. If you don't have guard play, it's, it's going to be, you know, a, a challenge for you coaching wise, but it, it enhances coaching and it makes the game more fun for the players too. It's just more up paced. And, um, you know, I, I laugh because some people tell me that, well, it's the shot clocks are tough to learn how to use. It's literally a button. In an AAU, when people made a mistake, because some parents had to do it, if you made a mistake and it was at the end of the game, the ref just blew the whistle, they got it to half like it was supposed to be, and then away you go. And it took maybe 10, 15 seconds. So 
Uh, shot clocks aren't hard to use. The pricing might be an issue. Um, at Shawano, we already had shot clocks for some reason. They were there when I was hired. Um, so I got a chance to use those from time to time. Um, some of the players will tell you I use them as a backboard quite often. Um, but uh, no, so I, I love the shot clock in the FEA. You know, there's some coaches that'll hold it for a while. Um, you know, Lee Rubis is one who is, a, you know, he wants a shot clock, but he'll, he'll four corner you as well because he wants to win, which is the right move. Um, you know, for us in the playoffs, we had uh, some injuries, some foul trouble, and we had the ball for, you know, three you know minutes and change and ended up turning it over and then got it back and got our player back in, had a shot to win it, but didn't work out for us. Hortonville held, you know, held versus us in, in the regional final as well. So it's works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. So wasn't it, I correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it approved like, and they were going to install it and then like they just they went back on it because of the cost or whatever too many people complain because i think kimberly has shot clocks on in their gym too i do believe that's what happened and and the pricing is but if you order a lump sum of them too that cuts down on pricing as well sure um but you know just with everyone using a shot clock and by everyone i mean you know quite a few states use it overseas they use it at the younger levels it just enhances iq and enhances skill and you know, just from a, from a high school standpoint, like if you're a high schooler, if you can go buy somebody, it's just, you know, more conducive for success for you. So it's, it's a more fun game for the kids and the coaching aspect, there's a lot of different things you can tweak it and do some things set wise with it. So it's, it, I really enjoyed it. Um, so I I'm hoping it happens. And I know most coaches that I've talked to want it as well. So did you see the, um, with sports or whatever they, I, I saw it on their, on their site that they put out. So they, well, all of you guys were, I think you guys were voted on it, right? Not, not voted for it, but like, do you want to, it was just like a survey, whatever you were asked that correct this past year. Yeah. Was maybe, or was it a small, maybe it was not everyone, but they came out that like, it went from D one down to D five and the percentage of coaches that wanted it and didn't want it. And it was like, 85% in D1. And then it was like 75% in D2. And as you got to the lower levels, it was like 20% of D5 coaches wanted a shot clock. Did you, did you see that at all or no? Those numbers? Yep. 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 No. And you know, I, you know, that didn't surprise me just because of, you know, the funds, the stuff in your account to, to pay for it. Um, and, you know, there should be, you know, more talent at the bigger schools because you have so many more kids to choose from. So if, if you have talent and you have skilled guards, it is so much fun. And if you don't have that, it's, it's, you know, why change something that isn't broken too. So I understand both sides. Um, but, you know, for us, it's, you know, it's just makes the game more fun for the kids. So. I don't know if you were, so we were talking at Holy Cross about it. I don't know if you heard, I think Jeff Kinzinger brought it up. I don't know who he was. I don't know if he was talking to someone or something came out about how, like the people that say like the shot clock, you don't need a shot clock. It was because he was saying that, that it was like the shot clock never it never gets used or it never goes, goes off. Like there's, there's like no shot clock violations. Did, were you part of this conversation at all or no? I, I was not, but I understand what he's saying though. Yeah. So point. people were like, well, we don't need a shot clock because in the, in the States that have the shot clock, there's never any shot clock violations. And it's like, well, you're kind of missing the point because there's no violations because people are shooting before yeah, they the have shot to. clock. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if you look at a normal game, you know, I would argue, you know, we sped up more than I have in the past this year, just based off of our talent. Um, and if we had a shot clock, you know, 99% of the season, we, we wouldn't have broken the shot clock. You know, our young guys like to shoot, you know, pretty quickly and they're skilled at it. And we want to shoot in transition, you know, be aggressive. Um, you know, so it wouldn't affected, you know, us too much, but there is moments where, you know, there's, 45 seconds and you're playing a Kimberly in a close contested game where you want the ball for the win or you want, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's to me enhances the game because it makes people think quicker. Guards have to keep playing. You don't just get a chance to just sit there for, you know, sit on it for the last minute. So to me, it's the end of the halves, end of the game, you know, overtimes, things like that is probably where it would affect it the most. Um, but, you know, there are some teams that, that play slow and it, it might be challenging, but, and the FEA used to be that way, but we've kind of gone away from that in years past. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think you get the coaches that are voting not for a shot clock are the ones that I don't want to say can't coach at that like speed, but just don't want to because it's like it's it is a complete a com total adjustment if you have to you know if you got to shoot in thirty or thirty five seconds. Yeah, for sure. There's there's some coaches that want to work the ball around until you get an absolute great look and. 
I used to be one of those. I'm a, I'm a disciple of, you know, coach Anderson, Chaz Franchinski. They're phenomenal coaches. Obviously Anderson won a couple state titles and, you know, back when I played, I had a hard time as a player because there wasn't a shot I didn't like. And if I got it early, I, I was usually, if I was ever uncovered, I wanted to throw it up. And, you know, I had to learn pretty quickly to play within the team and, and things like that. So it, it's definitely new and, and a change for some guys. Hopefully it comes. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah, that's yeah, that's all I can say is hopefully, hopefully at some point it does come and you're still coaching. Um, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be an unintentional podcast without talking about flopping. <laughs> um, so my big, a big thing that I had this past year was I was just one specific team and everyone knows listening, Nina flops all the effing time and it drives me nuts. Um, you may think differently. And you, I mean, I know you probably, you know, I'm at home watching four games at a time. You're, you know, you're coaching your game, whatever. So I don't know how much you actually watch all, you know, how much film and stuff like that. I'm sure it's plenty, but. Do you think that, and this, you could even, this isn't just like an FEA or a high school problem. Cause if you watch, did you watch the bucks last night? Was it, yes. Yep. Yesterday? Parts of it. Yep. Like, I mean, Kyle Lowry, I'm just, I can't even, do you think that there is a flopping problem at any level or do you like, do you, does, does it stick out to you? Like when you're playing and you're like, you've got these like 17 and 18 year old kids just hitting the deck. Yeah. The, probably the thing that, that with the flopping, cause every team does it to a point. Um, you know, you know, for us at Appleton North, we don't have a lot of guys that went off the bounce. So we were a, a, a jump shooting team, so it didn't affect us going, you know, going to the rim nearly as much, but the falling on threes is probably the one thing that gets me. Um, and I, I could list, you know, even Tyler hero, for example, you know, has done it in the past and that's Jordan McCabe's done it. Like every good players done. you watch the NBA, they do it all the time. Um, and I think it's more of a basketball issue just with the flopping in general. And from a charge standpoint, it's, you know, I kind of wish they'd take it out. And, you know, we, we teach wall up drills all the time. And it's, if it's just a tough shot to make, if you're going full speed at the rim and a guy jumps vertically with you and he's not moving into you, he just jumps straight up. That's a tough shot to finish. And if they finish it, you just tip your hat to them. But we have some officials that'll call that a, a block, no matter what. I had a couple of fish, officials tell me this year that you can't jump straight up with them. You got to stay on the ground, which is clearly wrong. Yeah, it is wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's it's different for everybody. But, you know, the, the flopping thing, the, the NBA is probably the worst. Yeah. You know, you know, watching it, I mean, especially with the talk now after yesterday with John ja Morant and, and Joel Embiid and, then and, you know, Giannis taking a fall. It's after you've already left your feet, you know, sliding in there. And I, I took a lot of charges growing up, too. And um, I, was, I was taught to do things. Now, granted, not the same, at, you know, athletes going against. Um, but just the overall, you know, we were taught growing up, as soon as they get into you, push off the balls, your feet, go fly and give a big yell. Uh, Coach Bork used to have me demonstrate at camps all the time. And, um, but it's, it's definitely gotten worse. And the stuff that, you know, the shooting that probably irks me the most, but you know, some of my guys will do it from time to time too. Cause if you get touched a little bit, you want to sell it. And it's, it's, I don't know how you get it out of the game completely, but the charge at the rim I don't know if, if you need to have one, to be honest with you. So you on the shooting, you're talking like the offensive player, like kicking their legs out. Yeah, kicking the legs out, um, you know, because there's a lot of good players that I've coached against in AAU, college, high school, that'll kick the legs out. I know when I was younger and able to, and I had a little bit more vertical, I'd kick my legs out too. Um, but, you know, the falling to the ground and, you know, that's that's a bit much at times and, Usually if there's a foul on a three, it's, it's pretty evident. And if the legs are kicked out, you're, you're trying to get one. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not, you know, with me, I don't, I'm not saying you can't, there aren't charges or things like that, but it's, it's the times where you see kids just like hit the deck, you know, they're on defense and they just, they hit the deck before there's even contact or just there's nothing. And they're just dropping, you know, like that's the stuff. It's like, I don't know if it's taught or, or whatever, but it's, it's clearly a problem. Do you talk about it with your team? Not, uh, so, not, not flopping, but like, do you, you know what at all? I mean, is it acknowledged? Yeah. So we, we, we talk about, you know, the, the times to take a charge. Usually it's predicated based off of who has the basketball and who I think is, is going to kick it out. Who's not going to kick it out. So, and if you're, if you're someone who has no chance of altering a shot, if you leave your feet, I tell you just to stay and get run over honestly. And if you're someone that can get up a little bit or you have some length to you, wall up, stick your chest up, jump as high as you can. Don't move your arms. Just be, 
just just contest the shot as much as possible. So for us, it's more of who we're playing and, you know, just deciphering who's coming down the lane or, or who's attacking. Um, and if there are guys that shoot threes, you know, we talk about so-and-so specifically is going to kick their legs out, give them a little extra space, contest the best you can. And if they happen to hit a contest, I always say tip your hat to them. Um, so, uh, you know, we do do uh, we, we do have some charge drills that we do. Uh, we don't do too much of it because um, when we do, some of our kids take advantage of that guys and sending them flying ends up kind of being a kind of a circus at times but uh we do mainly wall up stuff okay so all right i just i i had to pick your brain on it because it's the thing that i talk about all the time uh you mentioned officials i didn't put this on the agenda but since you mentioned it i do want to and i i'm not gonna i don't want to get you in trouble and i don't want you to get in your, your trouble about <laughs> officiating but what do you do when you get an official like that that clearly doesn't know like a rule um you know i I feel like I've calmed down in the past few years, uh, having some kids will do that to me. Um, but I, I have a lot of conversations with them and usually I'll get a partner involved and nine times out of 10, that official will, will come over and say, I didn't mean to word it that way. He'll either have an excuse of how he phrased it, or he'll just say, you know, the ones that I level say, coach, my bad, I, I was wrong. You were right on that one. Um, you know, and I'll usually come back with something saying, well, I'm wrong, right? You know, quite often I'll, I'll admit it to you, but I won't tell anybody else, you know, like, um, so most will admit it. Um, the ones that, you know, coaches struggle with, you know, myself particularly are the ones that are adamant about something that I know for sure is wrong and not, not talking about specific fouls in the game because you have different angles. You could see things but like the actual rule books. So, um, most officials, you know, you know, you know, we did really well with this year. Um, so I can't complain too much. And, I didn't get a T for a couple years in a row now. So I'm pretty proud of that compared to how I started. If anyone would have saw me coach when I was in Shawano. So, yeah, I think that's, we, I think we talked about it at Holy Cross because there was a time where we were not getting any calls. And then we, <laughs> we got a call immediately after, after you had a conversation with one of the refs and we like looked at each other, like, well, that was, that was our gimme one, whatever. But um, I was going to ask you, how many technicals have you got in your career? Do you keep count? Um, in Shano, I, well, the issue I had in Shano, so I had four in my two years in Shano, two of them were in the same game. Um, so I got booted out of a game. Um, and that turned out to be, I was, I was technically right about the rule. The official gave an automatic T to one of my players on a tip dunk. And it was when my point guard shot a, shot a layup, got fouled. The ball was in the cylinder for sure. And he went up and flushed it down for no reason. So it shouldn't have been a basket at all. Right. Right. He gave my player a, a T because he said, you cannot touch the rim when the ball's in the cylinder. And so I, I deserved one for sure. And uh, the rule after that is you have to sit un until the ball's put back in play. And there was a ball went kind of out of bounds and that official ran to get the basketball. So I, I was standing and he sent me after. Um, but ever since then at Appleton North, uh, the past three years, I, I haven't gotten one. My assistant got one this year, Coach Miller. Shout out to him. Um, but uh, no, it, it's it's been each year I, I try to improve too. And, and, you know, we talked about this too. I, I, I try to call every official sir just because I want to be respectful. And you know, we, we might not always agree, but to me, that's just what I was always taught from Richie Davis and old coaches as well. So just trying to get better myself each year and calm down and not every – not everything needs to be argued and pick and choose your moments too. So, okay. I, I want to go back to something you said. Did you say you have to sit down? Yeah. So if you get a T that you, you have to sit down. Are you serious? Yep. What, is that like a high school rule? What is that? I've never heard of that. Yeah. So if, if your bench that you're in charge of, or if I get a T for, for whatever reason, um, you know, for, for cussing or, or arguing or whatnot, then you got to sit down any dead balls. You can stand up timeouts. You can stand up, but um, so like in the crest event, my assistant who got his first tee of his career, he's been coaching, you know, for 30 years, you know, keep that in mind. Um, he, he got a D and I just sit down because of him and he's, that's what he felt bad about. He always said, but I thought it was actually kind of comical. So I could razz him. He's got more than me in, in the past year. So it's, it's good fun, but, uh, yeah, so you gotta sit down. I have never, that's crazy to me. I've never heard that before. Wow. Yep. Yep. Um, that's another question that you, that I didn't have on the agenda, agenda, but are there any, I used to do this podcast years ago. I tried to always come up with a rule, like the most like uh, misunderstood rules. 
Is there a rule that you can think of? And maybe you can, I mean, it's, it's, I know I'm putting in the spot here. Is there a rule that you can think of that, that officials just cannot understand? Like this, the reason the over and back it's called, this podcast is kind of kind of called over and back is because there are some officials that have no idea how to call over and back. So is there anything that, that you, that you noticed more, more often than not that officials just do not get right or it's confusing? Um, you know, the one question that officials are different for, you know, th things that I've seen, it actually happened at Holy Cross is when there's a block and the ball already hits the backboard, but it's oh, going up. Yeah. And I know that in college, I, I do believe you were able to, as long as it was below the rim and it was, you know, it is what it is, but that doesn't really affect us too much blocking somebody because we're so little or, you know, us going to the rim. But, uh, I've seen that one, you know, have some issues over and back. Obviously you have to have everything over, but some officials, you know, may not see it that way. Yep. Um, and then the last one's probably like, if you do a jump stop and then like a rip and a step through and then leave off the opposite foot. So some officials will call it, some won't. And I mean, even you go on Twitter, like Jokic had a move where he did a jump stop, spin, rip through and then steps. And they called some people on Twitter, they're arguing back and forth. That's a travel. It's not a travel. So even fans and, and basketball people get it wrong too. So. I did that. That's funny. I did that one. Um, I have that rule saved on my phone because I had a buddy of mine when we played three and three did it all the time, right? You do his pivot foot, whatever, and then yep. you go off the other foot. And I had to have it saved on my phone because everyone would call him for a travel. I'm like, you guys, it's not a travel. And like, I'd bring up the rule, but like, you know, so I had that on my podcast. It's funny because girls do it all, do the, it time. all the time, all it's the time, all yep. the time. And it's funny when you get a game officiated by an official that thinks that it is a travel and you get a girl's game that they officiate because all they do is call travels the entire time. Yep. It's, it's unbelievable. And it's a nice move too, because it is. after you do your jump stop, the defender thinks you're, you're dead and they yep. kind of ease up for that second. Then you rip through, go underneath them and, and, and go finish. So it, it's a good move. It happens a lot in the NBA and people just attribute it not being called in the NBA because it's the NBA when, when really it's, it's legal. So yeah. The, the other one I always got was, that I always love officials just messing with is like top of the backboard, side of the backboard. When the ball has to like, this is how I learned it was the basketball, the backboard's a tunnel behind the backboard. If it enters in the tunnel at any time, it's out of bounds. So like it can sit there and bounce on the top of the backboard as much as it wants. And if it comes back into play, it's in play, but there are officials that'll call if it hits top of the backboard, it's out of bounds. Yep. Nope. I I've seen that as well. So and at Appleton North, that's probably a little bit tougher because for whatever reason, our wires are below the beam. So we have a lot of balls hit, hit the wire. And that's probably my biggest frustration is with our own court is the wires are underneath it. So if you back room a ball, it's going to hit the wire for sure. Can you can you fix that at all or no? Or is it just the way it's we I, I talked to our old athletic director, Nate Warren, quite a bit about it. Um, I, I think it would cost a pretty penny. We just didn't have the funds at the time. So. Okay. All right. Um. We'll get to more rule stuff probably when we have you on more. Uh, what was next here? All right, let's look at before we get to your Tyler Hero st story. What? Uh, so we FEA seasons. I mean, it's a ways away. We got AU season coming up, and we got the FEA. I mean, we're like what six months away, give or take. Um, I know you probably can't say too much because you're an actual coach in the in the FEA. Um, anything you're expecting to see? Anything that you're uh, just a little preview here. I'm going to kind of preview the, the season. I think you guys are going to be good. Yeah, no, we'll be interesting. You know, we're, we're still really young, you know, us specifically will have, you know, three freshmen who played really major minutes for us Two started, um, you know, Will Sweeney started a little bit as well, you know, battled some injuries, played key. He was key for us down the stretch. Um, so, and then we have Abraham Tamari back who's a sophomore this year who has had a really good finish to the season as well. So, so we are really young. Um, but with that could go one of two ways and we're not very big. So, you know, we got to play fast and do some things, but our league is, you know, a lot of teams have a lot of players back, you know, Kakana has their entire roster back. They're super skilled. Um, Kimberly, you know, played really well when Myron went down and that's not a knock on Myron. He's a heck of a player. Um, but it was just kind of interesting how how they they played, you know, when he went down and their JV teams are always successful. So they'll be talented. You know, Nina's always good. They got Brady Corso, one of the best guards, you know, coming back, if not the best. Uh, you got Oshkosh North with two all state players. Um, Oshkosh West lost quite a bit, but they still got, you know, Taylor back, who's who's extremely talented. And, 
you know, basically every team in our league has something you can look into to, you know, to give some faith in, you know, like even, um, you know, so, so I, I live in Greenville, so I know a lot about Hortonville, you know, see their coaches around. We have a lot of conversations. Um, they have a lot of talent coming up as well. And yeah. their JV team was very good. They had some, they had a really good mix of old and young guys up. Fond du Lac is kind of in that same conversation. So every team has, has talent coming up and it's just a matter of how they mesh together. You know, do teams defend well? Do they play well together? Do they get along? Um, and those are factors that I think will, we'll see how the summer goes and, and how, how things develop. So, you know, for us specifically, you know, we, our team got along really well. Um, you know, we had some adversity hit our team, you know, mid year. And, you know, when that some things kind of fit into place and roles were, were, you know, finalized and developed, we, we, we took off. So we're hoping to build on that, but the FEA is, is, is going to be a grind and there's a lot of talent throughout the entire league. Yeah. I'm excited. I I'm like, you know, Last year I had to kind of, I had Jameson. So I was like kind of even keeled on the podcast this past year. I didn't have Jay, but my, I have a senior and I'm like, I'm not going to pop off at the mouth too much because he's a senior. You never know. Uh, but next year is gonna be fun because I have no kids and I got no ties at all to Kimberly at all. So I can really, really, if people think I let loose already, it'll be probably a lot worse <laughs> coming up this, this, uh, this season. I'm excited for it. Um, no, looking th- forward to hearing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think Kakana probably, I shouldn't say Kakana is the clear favorite, but I think, you know, I said Oshkosh North was very disappointing this past year, um, as was Appleton East. But yeah, Kakana is scary, the fact that they have basically everyone coming back. Um, and you guys are young. Yeah, you guys are really young, but you guys are really, you're, those freshmen that you have are, oh my, they're just so, you wouldn't think that they were freshmen. I mean, they make freshman mistakes here and there, but they play like, and you watch them and you're like, these kids are probably juniors. They don't, they don't play like freshmen at all for the most part. Yeah, no, they're, and you know, the best part about all three of them is they're just such good kids and they compete with everything. Um, you know, Grant Hardy, if he loses a drill, he wants to run it back almost. And and that's what the good players want to do. And, you know, the, all three of those guys play together in AAU and they, they play against some really good competition. So they shouldn't see things that, you know, they haven't seen or, you know, be shell shocked ever. So they're a really good group of kids. They get along really well. And then you mix in an athlete like Abraham Tamari, who, who, uh, you know, this guy's the, uh, the, I'm the limit for him. And, you know, we have some good, you know, upperclassmen that are energy guys, defenders that can shoot a little bit that may not have gotten a chance to shoot a whole lot this past year. So it will be interesting, but, you know, there's some really good teams. You talk about Kakana, Oshkosh North, those two guys, they have are extremely impressive and, you got really good coaches in the league that get the most out of their guys. Um, and then you got some teams that, you know, like Appleton East, for example, even though they lost a lot, they still have La Chapelle, who's, who's talented, Cade, who, who had a really good year for them, and they have some size as well. So there's – I my, my my hunch is it'll be similar to this past year where there'll be some upsets all over the place, and it'll, it'll just be a really fun year next year. Um, Did you see – I don't want to full, throw fuel on the fire of some of, – of a – controversy topic but i will because it's fun okay. did you so there's all there's two different all state teams correct i do believe so yeah there's like a the wiz sports one whatever and then there's like an ap one right and the ap one has like four teams and then like an honor like a bunch of honorable mention stuff did you see that and did you see a glaring um omission from the state team um, to be honest with you, I didn't pay too much attention to that just cause I knew, you know, we wouldn't have anyone on there. Um, I did see some things on like social media about some players in the FEA that maybe were above guys that were second team or, or whatnot, but. Well, so that one was the, that was like the with sports one, whatever that one was, there was, there was, I think that one had first team and then there was honorable mention. So there was, you know, it was August from Hortonville that was not on it, whatever. But then there was two kids that were on second team FEA, but you know, whatever. So right. there's one, I, so there's one that came out and it's the AP one and there's a ton of kids on it, whatever. And I, I saw it and I didn't even really look at it. And then someone sent me a message on Twitter about it. Stevie Clark was not on the team at all, wow. at all, at all. And they do it. So they, when they, the way they do it, it's the AP one, it's all divisions combined. So that's why there's a ton of players, whatever. He's not on it. 
that honorable mention nothing yeah no i i did not see that that's that's not right i no, i can tell no, you it's from not. playing him uh, you know coaching against him um he he's a unanimous first team fea guy i mean he averaged 20 plus and yes he has Xavion with him but if Xavion wasn't there or vice versa that they would still be just as talented you know they they can do it on their own they play you know with each other well so i actually did not see that um but that is definitely clearing so i will uh, i will send it to you i'll send you the article um i oh, like i said i just i didn't look at it just because i like i saw the article because it was like headed by winchester being coach of the year um and i didn't realize that it was like all these players and things like that and then someone a, a dad of a player in the fea messaged me about it and i'm like yeah i saw it yeah he was on there and they're like, no, this is the article. Look at it. He's not on here. And I went and looked. So yeah. yeah there's a lot of a lot of politics in that. And you know, generally, if you make it to state too, you end up on a team a lot easier and things like that too. There's a lot of things that I'm not really a part of the of of that club with, you know, the you know, coach that have been around for a while that kind of look out for each other. I'm kind of only been in this for, you know, five years. So not sure if that's what happened, but yeah, Stevie Clark is an exceptional high school basketball player and yep. there's no reason he should be left off of any list. Yeah. I, um, yeah, there was a ton of politics to it. I've, as you know, and if anyone hasn't heard him, I'm, I'm going to do a, an all conference podcast in the summer at some point, just about how shitty I think it is in certain, and every sport, not just basketball. Um, I have so many notes on certain players and things like that. So what I'll probably do is I'll do that solo and then maybe I'll bring you in the week after and you can, tell me where I'm wrong or what, how things go down and don't go Perfect. down. But, um, okay. So we're, uh, we're almost out of our time here. So you mentioned before, we'll finish with a Tyler hero story. So you mentioned before you, you coach, Oh wait, one thing I want to ask, does Siebert still coach those freshman years for AU? No. So he, he got married and basically uh, had to walk away from it. They're coached by some coach from Nicolet. Uh, so. Everyone listening. There's the reason not to ever get married. <laughs> um. <laughs> Okay. I, I knew he, he, was it just this past, did he coach him last year or no? Yep. Yep. Coach okay. him the past two years. Okay. Got it. All right. I wasn't sure. Uh, and Siebert's going to be on, I'm going to have him on the podcast at some point too. He had reached out to me and said he wanted to be on. So I'll have him at some point too. Um, all right. So Tyler, so back to AU. So you coached, who are the, who are like the top five players you've, you've coached all time? Um, hero, you know, Jordan McCabe is up there. One of my favorite players of all time is Keyshawn Justice. Yeah, he, he had a phenomenal career at Santa Clara. Those two are on the same team. Um, Brevin Pritzel, uh, played at Wisconsin, obviously from De Pere. Uh, Blake Marcor, who's playing with the herd, he played with Pritzel. Um, and anyone that knows me knows I'm a huge Adam Pullman fan, but there's a lot of guys. Ethan Gusky from Sheboygan North had a really good AAU career with me and, and, and really good high school career, but I think I, I'm over 50 division one scholarship kids I, I've been around or coached and uh, it's, it's, I've been blessed to work with some really good athletes. Okay. So this is, so this is the, this is the shit I love about Tyler hero or hate about Tyler hero. So he, he breaks his hand last night, which sucks, right? It sucks. Yep. He does it diving for a ball that like probably maybe shouldn't have. And he's not like this lockdown defender. No one's ever can, you know, no one, Tyler hero is not going to be on any all defensive teams in the NBA ever. So I'm like, why are you diving? Whatever. Then he hurts his hand, which we come to find out is broken. What does he do? He goes in the corner holding his hand. And then as soon as he touches the ball, he shoots it. I'm like, Shooter, oh, shoot. of course he shot the ball. And he did. And it was awful. It was not close. But I'm just like, of course, Tyler Hero <laughs> shot the ball. And then you find out his, his hand's broken. And I'm like, that is just, that sums up Tyler Hero. So I would have shot it too. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, all right. So you've got about four minutes to tell us the Tyler Hero story. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't have to be your best one, but you're going to make it good enough so that anyone who listens to the podcast are going to want to come back and listen to the other ones. No. So my, so my favorite story with Tyler, we practice at Lawrence all the time because I was coaching there and I've always been asked, you know, when did I think he would, you know, he was going to be it. And so he was going to be a freshman in high school and we're playing on the Lawrence guys. Cause they're there. Um, their spring breaks different. They have trimesters and, so we're playing them, and Lawrence had a player named Jamie Nikitas, who was an all-conference player at, at Lawrence, you know, the leading scorer there, I think the single-season leading scorer. Um, but he was a long defender, could really defend, athletic, tough, hard-nosed kid. And when we started, he's like, who's your guy? And so I'm like, you're going to guard Tyler. And Tyler and him got to draw in a little bit, which is funny because, you know, Nikitas is a 21-year-old man, and here's Tyler going, and he's not even in high school yet. 
And what he did to him was Steph Curry esque. He we played to eleven. He had I think ten of the eleven, and he pulled up from thirty five feet, uh, almost on the Lawrence logo at center court. Left his hands, started walking off the court, running his mouth at him. And I'm sitting there, and he knocks it down. Everyone leaves the court, and Nikitas just freezes and looks at me, and he's like, "Kelly, come here." He goes, "What grade is this kid in?" I said, I told you he's going to be a freshman. And he, and he started arguing with me. He's like, not a chance. Cause he was scrawny though. Yeah. You know, he was about six foot one. He didn't hit his growth spurt yet. Six, one, six, two. But the way he scored was just from three, the mid range game has always been his bread and butter. He got to the rim. Obviously he wasn't dunking or anything, but it was smooth right hand, left hand. And what he did to a, a player that was a division three, all conference kid. We, I walked out of that gym going like, Oh my gosh, like we, we got a player. He's going to be special. He's different. Um, and he, him and McCabe would show up early and, and go through stuff before practice too. So he had that drive in him as well. So that's probably one of my favorite stories. Um, I got a lot of them, especially, you know, with this old man and, and the trips we took together, but, uh, no, that, that was the moment where I, I knew he was different that, and he had some battles with Kobe King and AU practice where he gave it to Kobe and Kobe gave it back a little bit, but there was one day where he was just absolutely unbelievable and Richie Davis and I just kind of sat back and laughed and watched it because eight guys just kind of watched those two go one-on-one -on -one and it was pretty special to see. Okay. That's a good story. So now you have a new job for this podcast. Maybe I'll have to have you on next week already again. Your job is to make me a Tyler Hero fan. And my, my kids say all the time, like, Oh, you love Hero. You love him. I'm like, I don't, I'm not a Tyler Hero fan. So now your job is to make me actually like Tyler Hero. That's Do you hate the mid -range or what? What's that? Do you hate the mid range? I just don't like his, I don't like his arrogance. I just, you know, like I just. Oh I man. Know. No, he's honestly, I, I, I really hate Steph enjoy. Curry. I hate, by the way, I hate Steph Curry. Cannot stand Steph Curry. <laughs> I n never got a chance to coach Steph Curry. That would have been cool too. But no, Tyler was, uh, he was real coachable. And yeah. if he wasn't, his dad would have gotten all over him. But, you know, I enjoyed having him and, you know, there's a fine line between arrogance and, and confidence and he toes it, but he's also put in the time to be able to do that. So yep. no, he's, he's, he's a stud. I, I enjoyed having him for the couple of years I did and hope he continues to have success and, and we'll see what happens. All right. We got about 45 seconds left. So that, that's where we're going to end. I, that's an awesome story. I do like that story. So um, thank you for coming on. We're going to do it again. Maybe next week. We'll see. Uh, maybe you can, maybe you can run the agenda for next week. If you have certain specific stuff you want to talk about, talk about, which I know you do, but, um, but thank you for coming on. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for listening as well as you have listened, to, uh, all year. So, uh, that's going to do it everyone. Um, I guess it's simply, this is, uh, this has been over and back. Chris, I'll hit you on i uh, I'll send you a text. Thank you. All right. Thanks again.